CBS reports of special broadcasts are justice, justice denied. With CBS News correspondent Eric Severide. The mills of the gods grind slowly. So do the mills of American justice. So slowly that in case after case, justice itself is defeated. This is not new, just worse. Dean Roscoe Pound warned the whole legal community about this in 19th in a speech still quoted. Woodrow Wilson said that our judicial procedures are behind those of every civilized country in the world. Chief Justice William Howard Taft warned about it, Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes. Thirteen years ago, Chief Justice Earl Warren said that interminable and unjustifiable delays in our courts are corroding the very foundations of constitutional government in the United States. President Nixon has implied strongly that the American courts now can guarantee neither a speedy trial nor a safe community. The present Chief Justice, Warren Burger, spends a high proportion of his time and energy trying to do something about this. The code word to describe the condition is court congestion. This has become one of the symbolic phrases of our time, like pollution or urban crisis. This condition is an integral part of the profound American crisis of confidence. How and why did it come about? How does it affect private lives, the public safety, the very quality of justice? This is what we want to show you in the second of these broadcasts about the American court system. Anyone charged with a criminal offense should realize that they have basic legal rights. First of all, every person charged with an offense has a basic right to be represented by an attorney of his choice if he wishes to. Among the rights defined by the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution is a speedy and public trial. But the hallmark of American justice is not speed, but delay. Cases are backlogged, sidetracked, then hustled through, not in public, but behind the scenes. Law, order, and justice all are being undermined by the congestion in the American courts. In Chicago, 7,500 serious crimes brought to court in a single year, almost a third are disposed of as minor offenses or lost in the shuffle. In Cleveland, it takes an average of two and a half months before a man arrested for a crime even gets a day in court, a chance to plead guilty or not guilty. In New York City, the lag between arrest and trial is the longest, the backlog the heaviest. In the summer of 1970, the logjam became so thick that the channels of justice backed up from the congested courtrooms into the crowded jails. The riots in the tombs and other New York City jails where people accused of crimes are held if they cannot afford bail while they wait for trial. Speedy justice, according to a special White House commission, means no more than four months between arrest and trial. In these jails, there are well over a thousand people who have been waiting at least six months. And in that well-used maxim, justice delayed is justice denied, not only for the accused, but also for the public. If you were arrested in Indianapolis, you would be legally entitled to a trial within six months if you insisted upon it. You could wait it out at your home with your family if you could pay the bail money. Otherwise, guilty or not, you would lay it out, as they say, in Marion County Jail. As jails go, it's a relatively humane place to wait for your day in court. The place where producer John Sharnick begins in a survey of justice in that community. You know, I suppose the ordinary person seeing uh, people behind bars in a jail assumes that they are convicts, that is, that they have been convicted. You have people here whose guilt or innocence has not yet been determined by the court. That's correct. Is that right? We do. I would say that normally 75 to 80 percent of the people within our jail is avoiding trial. What do, uh, what do people do while they're in here? Sit, mainly. However, I try to... Uh, get as many magazines and as much reading material into the cell blocks for the inmates to be able to consume something. What about recreation? Any? Well, here again, since I'm a holding point and they have not been convicted of the crime they were arrested for, there's nothing I can make these people do with the exception of being incarcerated. I cannot give them a recreational period. Basically, the only time they get out is to go on sick call to work. The doctor here, this is the only recreation they would have. As far as a waiting uh, period for the people, well, I've never tried to figure out an average because, again, I have had it all the way from one day up to four years. Mr. Bailey, how long have you been in here? Just about 11 months. Just about 11 months? Yes, sir. And you're here for what purpose? Waiting on trial. 
A trial on uh, what charge? Well, I supposedly have strong arm robbed a man of $150. Something I know nothing of. Now, why haven't you had your trial before this? Well, the state keeps continuing my trial. The state does? Yes, sir. I was ready four months ago, mm -hmm. and they continue. Do you have an attorney? Yes, sir, I have a state-appointed attorney. State-appointed attorney. Now, what does he say about all this? Well, I haven't talked to him very much. You know? I've talked to him about three times. He's always wanted me to uh, get, a, get a plea guilty to a charge of one to ten. Now, if I understand right, if you had pleaded guilty, you would have already been out of jail. Probably would have. I probably would have went in front of the parole board in a year. and made parole, I probably would have been out. Sounds like a pretty good deal. If I was guilty, I probably would have taken it. But, uh... But you didn't take it? No, sir. Because? I'm not guilty. Two months after this was filmed, more than a year after he was put in jail, the robbery charge against Leonard Bailey was dismissed. Bailey remained convinced his case had been delayed by the state. The official records say it was postponed at the request of the defense. One of the complaints of the prisoners who rioted in the New York City jails last summer was that defense attorneys played along with the prosecution in keeping trials out of the congested courts. But sometimes it is the public, not the accused, that suffers most while waiting for that day in court. For every innocent victim of court congestion, Prosecutor Leroy New is convinced, there are hundreds of criminals who exploit it at society's expense, habitual criminals who remain on the streets while their trials are delayed. One former beneficiary is Rick Desmond, that's an alias, who is now serving time on a narcotics charge. Before that, however, for three years, he was free on bail while waiting for his trial on a robbery count, a trial that was repeatedly postponed. Finally, the case was dismissed when the victim died. You were on bond for almost three years on that case. Yes. Now, what did you do? What activities generally did you engage in while you were on bond? Pushing dope? Uh, mm -hmm. Hustling prostitutes, okay. robbing, robbing a drugstore, okay. several businesses. How often? Whenever the money was right or whenever I ran out. Now you were using the money for what? Uh, drugs and supporting a whole bunch of hanger owners, I guess you'd call them. Okay. Did you uh, make enough money at stick-ups uh, to support your habit? Well, uh, not in cash money like on that drugstore. We, we, I didn't go in after cash I went in after drugs. Another way Rick financed his drug habit was by working for a car stealing ring. Eventually you were hoping to get a car moved every day or so? Yes, uh, and, but they started ordering nothing but new Cadillacs. And they started ordering by, like this order here was for a 1968 uh, Fleetwood Burgundy. Now you actually stole some cars several times, right? That one Ford was sold eight times. All right. In other words, you stole it, you sold it to a buyer who was a legitimate buyer, mm -hmm. then you'd steal it from him and sell it to someone else. No, I never stole it, but I sold it. You sold it. And, but you know it was actually transferred and stolen from the buyer, ultimate buyer, eight different times. Car thefts, robberies, drug offenses, all these crimes were committed while Rick was waiting for trial in the congested courts, a trial he never did have to face. Did you really think you were going to make it out there on that street handling dope? I made it a long time. For the guilty along with the innocent, justice is being postponed, and increasingly justice is being replaced by a process known as plea bargaining, trading a guilty plea for a lighter sentence. Instead of what the Constitution calls for, trial in a public courtroom, it is justice behind closed doors. This is the office of Prosecutor New, Defense attorney Gil I. Berry represents a man accused of running a car-stealing syndicate, the same group that Rick Desmond worked for. As you know, this guy is charged with vehicle taking, theft ring, as you allege, not as I allege, but as you allege. Is there any possibility whatsoever of working this matter out without a trial? Well, Gil, I think the only way we're going to settle this case is for your man to take an executed one to ten, unless, of course, you feel he's not guilty at all as charged. 
If you feel that way, we're going to try them, and we're going to try them on all the cases we've got because our information shows they were stealing a car a day. Your man was fencing the cars in another county, and uh, he was the man who received the money, he was the man who delivered the cars, he was the man who delivered the phony titles. So we're not in any position to back off. Well, between you and me, I think you've got a case against my client. All right. I think you have some problems in the proof of your case. Uh, number one... Let me interrupt you to show you just what we've got here, and there's no reason for me to hide this from you because the Supreme Court now says I got to show it to you anyway. What we have here are the list of the cars, the dates, the serial number, the date they were stolen, the date they were delivered by your man, how much he made for them, the, actually the color of the car. And uh, there isn't any running room. The man's in the corner. Now, the only thing I can tell you that I can do is give him an executed one to ten. Now. Are you in any position to go along with what the state is offering at this no, time? No, I'm not. You have broken up the ring. Your detectives have broken up the ring. Half of the individuals involved are doing time or on, are on suspended sentences That's with right. strict reporting procedures to uh, probation purpose. Why penalize this man? He has convinced me. He is genuinely shaken about this incident. He has paid his price. He has a criminal record of being arrested. He's been mugged, booked, etc. His family has been genuinely hurt. They have had to move out of their residence to a, a lower class neighborhood because their friends, their family uh, have disowned them. This man mentally, physically has paid the price. Now here you want to penalize him over again. My point is I'm willing to plead guilty to the two charges pending. If you want to file two more, I'm willing to plead guilty to those for a suspended sentence and a strict reporting procedure if possible. In plea bargaining, the state usually offers to reduce the charge and the penalty in return for a guilty plea, or as in this case, the prosecutor may offer to drop some of the counts if the defendant will plead guilty to the basic charge. I want this wrapped up. I don't want the state to go to the expense of four trials, and even if we convict on all four, he's running them concurrently. We're no better off. This is a waste of the taxpayer's money. But on the other hand, we're gonna have to do something. And so far as I'm concerned, he's going to have to pull his time. I, I don't want to be hard-nosed about it, but very well, frankly... You're caught up in your case, and I'm caught up in mine. There's just no possibility of reconciling this thing. I'm going to have to try it, and you're going to have to be prepared, because I'm going to shoot all barrels at you. you got everything, everything out of our file now, I've Gary. got you everything know, You know what we got. You know we got the aces. I think you said that. We had the case. There's not much more we can do. Uh, I'll still make my bargain that if you can convince the auto detail who did the work, who took the grand jury, and uh, Lord knows they've got files here that uh, won't quit. If they're willing to give him suspended time, I'll go along with the policeman. He's the man who's out there on the street, and there were a couple of situations where they were in some pretty good danger on this thing. If they're willing to give him suspended time, you know I have no ax to grind. We've got a lot of other cases here. But uh, if it's up to me, I think your man's going to have to go inside. Well, there's no way of working it out. Might as well just go to If there's any change, Gil, let me know. Here, no bargain could be struck, so Attorney Berry's client went to trial. The verdict, guilty. The penalty, a suspended sentence and a $3,000 fine. In some cities, plea bargaining has taken over to such an extent that nine out of 10 cases are decided that way. Under the pressure of court congestion, due process becomes the exception instead of the rule. There is a vast area of justice in which there are no prisoners behind bars, no criminals on the loose, and yet basic rights are in jeopardy. Rights that all ordinary citizens, all communities depend upon. This is the area of civil justice. The courts that deal with everyday things like contracts, property rights, claims arising from injuries of one kind or another. And in the civil courts, the logjam is at its worst. If you are hurt in an auto accident, for example, it now takes you, on the average, almost two years to get your case into court. In New York and Chicago, it may take six years. Los Angeles County Superior Court, East District, located in the city of Pomona. In this district three years ago, the courts were so clogged with criminal cases that only one civil lawsuit got to trial all year. Ever since then, court congestion has been a personal cause to attorney Herbert Half a subject on which he writes articles, makes speeches, serves on committees. It's also a fact of daily life, one he encounters every time he goes to the court clerk's office to file a lawsuit. What, what, what uh, position would that be like in terms of uh, where they're presently trying? I mean, what's, what's the uh, Department A position on civils? 
Well, they're probably, if this is the civil trial. Yeah. It'll probably be about a year before. It's set. Before it's set. Before You'll be it's lucky. Even... You'll be lucky if it's yeah. within a year. The backlog of civil cases here has been reduced to about 1,300, but that's still two years' worth of lawsuits at the rate they're being tried or settled. Not only private claims, but suits affecting the very life of the community. An urban redevelopment project for Pomona's decaying business center is dragging on for lack of courtroom space to settle property values. A movement to take legal action on the environment has been discouraged. The prospects of a hearing are as dim as the polluted landscape. Assuming that you can move into the court with the lawsuit, it would be three years before it actually came. And then you'd add a three-year appellate process. And sure as heck, there'd be something wrong with it the first time through. So you'd go back through it. What is that, six, seven years? I mean, my God, uh, that's the extent of the congestion. Uh, another way of looking at it is to say that there were 11,000 cases at issue in the civil field waiting for trial in 65. Today there's over 40,000 cases. I mean, it's a 400% explosion. Now, the beautiful part about civil litigation, and it even applies to criminal litigation, but particularly civil litigation, is that people are afraid of court. They are afraid to actually put their dispute to that independent trier of fact. That scares them right down in the roots. It's the closest thing they're ever going to come to the true democratic experience, and it scares them. So they don't want to be, they don't want that day. And from that comes the cliche, cases settle on the courthouse steps. And uh, they really don't settle on the courthouse steps. They only settle on the courthouse steps if above the courthouse steps there's an open courtroom. And so suddenly cases pile upon cases, whereas the statistics indicate nine cases out of ten will settle before the courthouse? No more. Why settle? You're never going to get a day of reckoning. All right, in this matter of uh, Guy Russell versus James uh, Vega, Mr. Half, uh, we're going to try and settle this case if we can possibly do so because the trial date on this case is the 23rd of uh, November on Monday. And uh, I already have about 24 cases set for that day. So if at all possible, let's see if we can't get down really to the hard facts of this case and work out a settlement. Vega and Russell are fictitious names to protect the privacy of the clients. Half's client, Mr. Russell, operated a convalescent home besides holding a regular job until he suffered a hip injury in an auto accident. The driver of the other car, Mr. Vega, is represented by Bruce McLaughlin, attorney for Vega's insurance company. To demonstrate the pressures of court congestion on cases like this, the attorney suggested that we listen in while they reconstructed their arguments for a settlement in the chambers of Judge Henry W. Shatford. And it seems to me if the jury gets in the jury room, they're going to come up with somewhere around twenty to 25,000 in specials and then you have to add on all the pain and suffering and discomfort that this man's had over this period of time. It's been a substantial period, and evidently it's going to be substantial, and when they see this particular operation, they know there's going to be something of a nature there, so somewhere between 40 and even 60,000, that high is going to be the range of the verdict. Don't you agree? Uh, Judge, uh, I agree with everything you said up until the last two figures. <laughs> Anytime you put zeros on a well, number, maybe Bruce I get, gets maybe a palpitation I go from 35 of his heart. To 55, but somewhere in there, maybe no, 60. Well, see, Judge, I brought Attorney McLaughlin points out that even before the injury, the plaintiff had a record of poor health, diabetes, and circulatory problems. I think what the court said is a very reasonable range between 40 and 60 thousand dollars if you do not take into consideration the diminution of the value of this case due to the pre-existing condition and the natural progression of those diseases, both the diabetes and the arteriosclerosis. And I think some apportionment, like one-third of your evaluation, should be knocked off uh, or reduced from that for those reasons. And I'm just saying that, that, that if a case is properly presented, they're going to compensate this man for all the years of his life that we know medically certain he's going to have this. And I can't settle it any cheaper 
than in my heart I feel he's going to get from a jury. Now, the only problem Bruce keeps throwing up, which he hasn't even raised here, is he keeps saying, well, can the man wait? That is where the logjam hits the plaintiff. Can he afford to wait for a trial or for a settlement that has already been delayed for months because there was no courtroom open above those courthouse steps? Uh, can you settle this case uh, within this range without calling New York or London or someplace? Uh, Connecticut? I have been given, frankly, a authority that is on a very low range of what the court has recommended. We've asked for their policy, Judge. They've, got, they've only got a $50,000 policy in this case. And I just don't think it's fair uh, that an insurance company, in effect, exposes the client to ex his, their client to excess liability by not settling this case within that policy. Because this is not a case where we were talking about a $5,000 verdict. This is a case where we could have a seventy-five dollars or $100,000 verdict. And I think we're being reasonable when we ask for the policy in this case, which is $50,000. Forty is what I have, and that's on the level here. I'll buy that, but I can't take it. I mean, I appreciate what you've done, Judge, but I mean, I can't take. Uh, I can't How take forty thousand. How much is it going to take? You're so close; it's razor edge. Uh, the the thing that I mean, the day of the trial, they'll pay the policy, Judge, and I mean, it's uh, it's the same old story. I mean, I I mean, I I, I mean, I don't even think. I mean, I. Uh, What's I think the, you're making an assumption that's not necessarily true, uh, Herb. I don't think they necessarily will pay policy limits on the day of trial. But I will shove it down the company's throat for 42.5 in the spirit of compromise. Okay, and that is really, that's the limit. You can't take the risk on the rest of that. This is the first time, I'll be honest with you, this is the first time that they've offered us anything, Judge. The first offer out of the chute was $15,000. Now we start moving, they're up to... Uh, a nice rational well, I think figure. You How's it? that policy figure, and, uh, and uh, my recommendation, if you're as close as we are right now, you ought to go make some phone calls and come back here and settle this case. You're that close. You can settle this case, and there's no sense in taking 10 days of this court's time, which it'll take, to try this lawsuit when we can settle this case well, right here now. This case, like thousands of others, was settled only when trial was actually imminent. Here, the plaintiff wrote out the pressure of the logjam. Attorney Half held out for his 50000 and finally got it. But, Judge Shatford explains, the results are often quite different. Logjam means delay. So people are forced to take less for their cases. People are seriously injured, desperately need money, are forced into settlements they would never make if they had the opportunity to try their cases. And... Really, the ideal of justice, of course, would be that we could litigate every case fairly and properly and promptly. And when, you, when you're not able to do that, the quality of justice depreciates accordingly. What do you think are the reasons that the logjam has come about? Well, of course, uh, population is an obvious uh, reason for the increase. All you have to do to realize that is get on our freeway in an evening and see the vast number of people now that are moving about in a given area. And the field of automobile accidents constitute a good 90% of our jury trial time. Also, when you get a megalopolis, like we're starting to call Southern California, and you compact a lot of people into a given area, the friction and tug and pull between those people is intensified so that there are more lawsuits arising out of the same number of people than w there would have been before where they're spread out over a greater area. Landlord-tenant cases, complicated warranty uh, cases, all sorts of litigation now is far more intense than it was a few years ago. So the very complexity of our society adds a great m many cases to our already tremendous caseload. It is not only a more compacted society, a more complex one, but a society in the throes of change. Revolutions in the name of justice have imposed new strains on the system of justice. Protest demonstrations have produced mass arrests, mass appearances in court. They also have produced new laws, civil rights acts, consumer acts, new laws resulting in new lawsuits. Meanwhile, the traditional business of the courts grows faster than the courts themselves. Ambulance in route, rear yard, 
Who stabbed you, Robert? Who cut your arm? In the last decade, the amount of crime has increased ten times more than the number of judges. One form of crime in particular has struck the courts with crippling effect. Case number one, there's four men on possession of marijuana. I'll go right down the line. Checks, pills, pills, burglary, uh, checks and, uh, pardon me, pills and weapons, narcotics uh, and pills, 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 checks, burglary, burglary, uh, four men on a burglary, marijuana. Judge Howard McLean of Los Angeles County reviews one day's calendar of cases in his courtroom. Well, as I add it up, and I usually do this, uh, we had 27 directly narcotic cases in our court, and then 25 non-narcotic. Some of the non-narcotic cases do involve narcotics in the background, such as the check cases, the burglary cases, this type of case, where we know that either uh, a burglary was committed to get money to use narcotics or as a result of using narcotics, something like this. Well, there is a complexity in hearing all criminal cases, and it, and it kind of snowballs in narcotic cases. There are motions to dismiss, which I have to hear, which takes court time. There are motions under what we call Section 1538.5 of the Code, which are motions to suppress evidence prior to trial. And these are hearings with witnesses and consume a lot of time, and, and a majority of the narcotic cases are pursued in this manner. Then the same issues of search and seizure, et cetera, are tried at the actual trial of the case, which is a duplication. And then there's a vast number of appeals in narcotic cases. The narcotic cases are, are flooding our court. At a national conference on the judiciary with keynote speeches by President Nixon and Chief Justice Warren Burger, five major areas of reform were cited as ways of breaking the logjam in the courts. Reforms that have been widely discussed in legal circles. One of them deals with the conduct of lawyers and judges. Everyone is for a speedy trial as a constitutional principle, but there is a good deal of resistance to a speedy trial in practice. This court commission out there this continued to the 12th of August in the AM. The practice in many courts is to continue cases, postpone them as a matter of routine. Now, I talked to the officer into the heavy court. Uh, we would like continuance, subject to approval, August the 24th at 9 AM. Is that correct, uh, sir? I'm sorry, but that's a Monday morning. And uh, since Monday mornings generally run to 1.30 in the afternoon, I prefer not to... Uh, 27th at 9 o'clock, subject to approval, Your Honor. It Honor. is full, too. Uh, well, how you, about going in the... I give you p.m. that day. Sometimes postponement is necessary in order to serve justice. But sometimes it is used to manipulate justice. In many other court systems, and again I relate to the English system, uh, it is a breach of professional ethics for a solicitor or a barrister to intentionally delay a trial. Indeed, it, it is classified as an obstruction of justice. And I think that this is an area where the whole American bar has got to take a hard look at uh, a built-in conflict of values. And this built-in conflict of values is that an American lawyer is supposed to do anything humanly possible to save his client or to represent his client on the one hand. On the other hand, he is at all times called, quote, an officer of the court. He has certain obligations to the court. And I believe that the solution is to, to do something like the English system and to require that all American lawyers owe their first obligation to the court and rely upon the court and the jury system, which is proven to be a very fair technique for the trial of crimes, to dispose of the case on the merits instead of playing cat and mouse games and stretching out uh, the long delaying period as a matter of defense. In order to set realistic deadlines on lawyers and judges, Chief Justice Berger has emphasized the use of business management techniques in the courts, a second area of reform. This involves the training of court executives to handle administration and the use of new technology. I do not suggest for a moment that justice can ever become automated or that production line processes are fully adaptable to the courts. But we must acknowledge that other professions have devised new ways of increasing productivity without loss of quality. 
and we must do so. By tradition, the business of the courts is done by musty procedures dependent on the hand and sometimes the memory of clerks. By programming their records, courts will be able to coordinate the schedules of judges with lawyers and witnesses. In Philadelphia, this technology is already being used to identify cases that have become stuck in the system. But there are also proposals to eliminate some kinds of cases altogether. Take them out of the courts, the president suggests, and turn them over to commissioners or even to clinics. You have to find ways to clear the courts of the endless streams of what are termed victimless crimes that get in the way of serious consideration of serious crimes. There are more important matters for highly skilled judges and prosecutors than minor traffic offenses, loitering, and drunkenness. I think we could take many uh, automobile negligence cases and other kinds of cases and move them over to administrative tribunals and not employ the court structure. Do we have any uh, uh, experience in this area? We certainly do. The workman's compensation laws in virtually every major American state, as you perhaps know, field hundreds of thousands of claims weekly uh, and monthly. And the number of, of workman's compensation cases that z literally zip through the administrative tribunals uh, probably outnumber two or three to one the number of negligence cases. Now, I know that many lawyers, particularly plaintiff's negligence lawyers, uh, would be very hostile to this idea. And I would propose uh, this kind of solution to the internal problem of the bar, that, that a litigant would have an option. And the option would be to go to the administrative tribunal, where the justice would be swift, or to wait and go to the court system. This would be a transitional phase until we can bring the courts to a point where they can provide uh, essentially the same speed in disposition as the compensation courts have. A fourth area of reform involves a process of appeal. It can take six months just to prepare the record of a trial, and then the upward process from court to higher court can keep the case unsettled for years. The trial of the Chicago 7, which ended in February 1970, just started on that process in February of 71. Do we overdo the business of appeals from convictions in this country? But I think we would do a lot, and, and a number of reform groups have made this suggestion, if we said that everybody gets one uh, hearing within six months or a year uh, with a lawyer who comes in and reviews the whole record, maybe two years, depend, might be longer for people with longer sentences, and that's it, unless he can show by a pretty uh, heavy showing that there has been newly discovered evidence or a, a clear Supreme Court decision going the other way. Of all the areas of proposed reform, the most sensitive involves that central right of our system, trial by jury in civil claims as well as in criminal cases. Mrs. Lefkowski, can you be as fair toward a woman charged with murder of her husband as you, could you give her the same right as you could any other individual? Yes. In most states, lawyers have almost unlimited leeway to challenge jurors, that is to reject them. To pick 12 acceptable jurors in this case, argued by defense attorney Percy Foreman, took just one day. In a Black Panther trial in Connecticut, it took four months. Some states now are limiting the freedom of challenge. Some have taken this process away from the courtroom. There are also proposals to reduce the number of jurors in some cases and to eliminate jury trials altogether in certain others. I mean, where is this blue ribbon type of committee or a referee that's going to be able to dissolve all problems when we've got that wonderful thing called a jury with 12 biased, imperfect people with their biases operating in every different direction? How come we're so anxious to get rid of them? And then I guess the, the thing that scares me the most is is the uh, final result of all of this chaos, of all of this breakdown attributable to congestion, is the demand on the part of the people for radical change. They look at a system and they say, well, the system's not working. We, it must be a bad system. It must have to be radically changed. We can't afford to have the delays inherent in such a system. 
And that's where they make a mistake, because they could solve this problem for very little. We only need one improvement. What is that? Put in enough judges. Put in enough courtrooms. Now, first let me make this clear. The jury system is absolute protection against tyranny of the judge and a tyranny of the administrative end of our government. So the jury system, the 12 on the jury, must be absolutely preserved in, in criminal-type felony matters, in all felony matters, because there, as I've said, if the government makes a charge against an individual, I think the protection of that jury system must be maintained. But when you come down off the felonies and you go into the misdemeanors, like in the municipal court, as to all traffic citations, the 12-man jury is ludicrous. It's too expensive. It can't be afforded. It ought to be eliminated. Now, most of the civil actions, I think six people on the jury is adequate enough. I have given some thought to a, to a break-off period. In other words, if you sued for an amount of 10,000 or 15 or 20 or less, then you'd only be entitled to a six-man jury. If you go for more and it's a tremendously important style or type case, then you still could have the 12. I think this this demands great inquiry, and I am in favor of the reduction in the size of jurors, except, as I've said, where you are dealing with the, the tyranny of the court or the tyranny of the government, and the court still stands as the very, very basic uh, protector of all our constitutional liberties. The methods are open to debate, but obviously reform is in the wind. The federal courts are planning to reduce the size of those juries in some civil cases. New York State, among others, is putting a time limit on delays for most criminal trials. And a good many judges and lawyers are re-examining their own responsibilities, not simply to their own professions, but to justice itself. Court congestion, not new, just worse, and not unique to America. In some countries, like Turkey or Italy, congestion is traditional and expected. They have never pretended to provide speedy trials. We have pretended. In most of West Europe, criminal cases get to trial within 60 days, even though crime increases there, too. Plea bargaining is impossible under some of those systems, used only sparingly in others. Here, plea bargaining, backroom deals between prosecutors and defense lawyers, has all but taken over the judicial process. It is a crisis response to that problem of delay, a condition that prevails not just in the state courts, but also in the federal system. In the United States District Court in Brooklyn, the normal wait for a jury trial is now about 16 months, and if the defendant doesn't have the price of bail, he spends those months behind bars. Of course, cynicism, bitterness, spread among those caught in the rusted cogs of the judicial machine. Of course, public confidence in the courts erodes. And, of course, our system of justice only faintly copes with the rising threat of ordinary crime. And it's crime in the courts that we will deal with directly in the next and final broadcast in a series on justice in America. This is Eric Severide. All right. Now, Sergeant Marshall, are you asking for continuance? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, I am, Your Honor. We'd like to subpoena our witnesses in. We'd like the case continued until September 17th. 